Hi, it's Carol Ann Lloyd, and it's time for another episode of Life Lessons from the Tutors. Today, we're going to be looking at a different kind of plan than we always think about, than we often think about even, and looking at ways that history shows us what's possible. Now, I know long-term plans are Great, they get they give you the big picture of what you want to do. They may go out three years or five years. It's looking into the future. And I remember once I was asked to create a five-year plan. And for me, that seemed perfect because it was long enough in the future I could imagine what could be possible. I could still see myself. 10-year plans tend to be a little harder for me. But five years, yeah, I could imagine myself in five years. At the same time, it was far enough away that I felt like I had time to make some of the big changes I wanted to make. So long-term plans are great. But I also want to talk about the right now plan, the plan that isn't long-term, the plan that's not focused on the future, but instead is focused on right now. I have to admit, just between you and me, that I got this idea from a TV show I used to be just obsessed with. I still watch, but I'm not quite as obsessed. And that's Grey's Anatomy. Back in the day, for those of you who may have seen Grey's Anatomy, when Mark Sloan was around, and it was one of those times that Richard was going to retire and they were going to need a new chief. And all kinds of people, including people coming in from other hospitals, were presenting their credentials and their vision. And someone coming in from the outside had a 10-year plan. And that seemed so impressive. So Mark Sloan, who wanted a leg up, was talking to Dr. Miranda Bailey, the heart and the wisdom of that hospital. And she said, I don't need a 10-year plan. I need a right now plan. I need a way to treat the patients in this hospital right now. I need a way to train the interns who are in this hospital right now. I need a right now plan. Well, Mark Sloan went into the board and presented a right now plan, and it was received pretty well. The idea is there is a need for long term. There is a need for thinking about the future, and there is a need for right now. It can be problematic. You can get so involved in the details of a right now plan that you lose the focus on the future. So I know it's a, it's a transition back and forth. But today I want to really look at the right now plan, knowing that there also should be a long-term plan. And in fact, the right now plan should align with the long-term plan and who you're becoming in the future. Now, when we think about the right now plan and why we need it, I want to call your time back. It seems like in some ways a long time ago and in some like ways, just like yesterday, to February of 2020. And I know in the beginning of 2020, I had a one-year plan and I had a five-year plan and I had a really nice long vision. And then March happened and everything changed. I had all these engagements booked and one by one by one, they were canceled. I had trips booked and one by one by one, they were canceled. And suddenly, People were contacting me and asking me to speak via Zoom and asking me to teach courses via Zoom and clients wanted meetings online and people were asking me how to engage audiences online. And what about starting a podcast or what about that book I'd been meaning to write for so long? And in that moment of March, and then as we moved into April of 2020 and we sort of got settled a little bit we realized that we couldn't do things in the way we had expected. If we didn't change, we were not going to move forward. And what I needed was a right now plan. I need to start a podcast, look into that right now. I need to work on that book right now. I need to learn all about Zoom right now because I need to be able to present programs and courses online right now. 
And a right now plan is what got me through that period of time. It got a lot of us through because we were forced to look differently at things. And it may seem like, okay, but that's over. That's done with. We've adjusted. We're now good at Zoom. We now have all these online things, but there will be another need. Because if there's one thing we know is that what we can count on is change. We're still in a new world. We're still figuring things out. There are employers that are now saying, okay, everybody back to the office. And there are employees who are saying, no, not going to do that. So are those employees coming up with a right now plan to say to the employers, I'm sorry, I'm going to be looking for a new job or I'm going to start my own business or I'm going to do something else. Are employers ready for a right now plan that accommodates what they've learned over the last four years and what they have envisioned for the future? Those right now plans will keep coming up because what's true is that what happened to us is not all that strange or unusual. It is not really, it felt like a once in a lifetime for many of us it was, But when you look at the scope of history across hundreds of years, it's not unique. These kinds of things, these upheavals, these happen all the time. It might not be the same as a worldwide pandemic, but things are going to continue to change. There will continue to be disputes about the best way to work. There will continue to be infectious diseases or other threats that are widespread. There may be violence. I mean, when countries change leadership, there is often the threat of violence and that will continue. Things will not turn out the way on a small scale and on a large scale, the way we thought they would. So whether it's a personal or a family or a community or an organizational or a state or a national or whatever, there will be times when you need a right now plan. It will be essential. And so what happens if you are faced, if you wake up tomorrow and you are faced with a need to quickly change direction, to see things in a new way, to communicate in a new way, to reach out to people in a new way, to interact with your business, with your customers in a new way? Do you have the ability to create a plan right now? So I want to look to history and see how history shows us what's possible. And I want to do that with one of my favorite characters or people from history, real person, of course, Mary the First of England. Now, Mary had a lifetime of things not working out the way that she and those around her had planned. So she's born in 1516. She is the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon two incredibly well-respected monarchs at the time. And she was the princess of England. She was revered and cherished by her parents and her people. And as no brothers came along, there was a period of time when she was recognized as the heir to the throne of her father. But if you know the story of Henry VIII at all, you will know that he was determined to provide a male heir to the Tudor throne. Now, in the 16th century, it was believed, it had been for hundreds of years, that monarchy was male. And the last attempt to have a woman take the throne, Matilda from hundreds of years earlier, had driven the country into years of civil war. And Matilda was not able to be crowned queen regnant and to rule uninterrupted because she was continually challenged for her throne. And Henry VIII was afraid that was what was waiting for Mary. So he decided he needed a new wife because his Catherine of Aragon wasn't having any more children. And before she knew it, Mary's mother had been replaced and Mary herself had been taken out of the line of succession Henry had married Anne Boleyn. There was a baby on the way. Well, that baby turned out to be a girl too. So pretty soon Anne Boleyn is beheaded. And now Elizabeth is also out of the succession. And then finally, Henry manages to have a son. 
And so when Henry VIII dies in 1547, Edward becomes the king. Now, at this point, Mary's probably imagining her life as an honored princess. Probably she's going to be married off. Everyone is expecting Edward to grow up, to get married, to have a family, and the throne to pass down his line. But as time goes on, he doesn't get married. He's very young when he takes the throne. He's only nine. But as he gets 14 and 15, it's probably time, but he doesn't get married. In fact, he devotes so much energy to religious reform that he and Mary, although they have been close, are in the outs over religion. Er Edward is completely committed to reform. Mary is committed to her Catholicism. So when Edward becomes very ill, he is faced with the reality of leaving his throne and his country pushed so far. And we see the word Protestant even coming up during this time into Protestant, not meaning the same thing it does today, but reform into the creation of this new Anglican church. It's pushed so far. And if he leaves the throne and his country to marry his half-sister, she is so devoted to Catholicism, she will take it back. And he's determined not to do that. Now, when you are the King of England and you become very ill, it's hard to keep that a secret. They tried, but they would finally have to have him make public performances. And his illness was progressing so rapidly that the public, not performances, appearances. So he would make a public appearance and he looked so awful that the rumors of his coming death you know, really swelled. It sort of worked against them. So at this point, Mary might very well be thinking, now's the time for me to start planning to become Queen of England because that throne is coming to me. I am going to become the queen. She'd really always believed that was possible thanks to her mother. Well, things did not turn out the way that Mary expected. Edward was, in fact, so determined not to leave the throne to his half-sister that he created the device for the succession. He's trying to find a male Tudor relation to leave the throne to. In fact, there are nine women available. Um, there just aren't a lot of Tudor men around. So, Edward decides that perhaps his cousin, Lady Jane Grey, will quickly get married and have a son. So his first version of this device for the succession, he is leaving his throne to the heirs male of his cousin, Francis Brandon, or her daughter, the male's heir of Lady Jane Grey and then Jane's younger sisters. Eventually, it becomes clear that Edward is not going to live long enough. Jane is married, but she is not yet pregnant. She does not have a son yet. And so he changes this device to leave the throne to Lady Jane Grey and her heirs male. In other words, he has created a law. He thinks he is trying to create a law. He believes that will overtake the law that was on the books or the, the parliamentary act that was um, legal at the time that named Mary as his heir. And he attempts to replace her with Lady Jane Grey. Now, Mary has a lot of contacts in the heart of Edward's court. So when she learns about what's going on and Edward is getting closer and closer to death and people are starting to notice that they are bringing arms and forces into the tower, that something is changing, that the Navy is now patrolling the waters around England as they prepare to make this startling announcement that Lady Jane Grey is now going to be queen. Mary gets the message from her followers, do not come when you are summoned to London. So when she is summoned to court, because there is a plot there to capture her, to eliminate her as an obstacle to Jane taking the throne, she goes the other way. And Jane Grey, when Edward dies on the 6th of July, 1553, it is Jane who is proclaimed Queen of England. 
Now, at this point, Mary could have just given in. She could have said, okay, I thought I was going to become queen. I'm not queen. I'll give up my goal of becoming queen. I'll give up my belief that it is my destiny. She was very fervent in her belief. Give up my belief. It's my destiny to bring England back to the Catholic fold. I'll give all that up. That's not what Mary's made of. No. Instead, faced with something that did not work out the way she thought it would, Mary came up immediately with a right now plan. She defied expectations. So when she learned for sure her brother had died, she wrote to the council and she said, I am your new queen. And the council wrote back and said, uh, no, you're not. Jane's the queen and you need to be quiet and obedient. <clears throat> Mary wasn't having any of that because she was too busy working her right now plan. So first, what she did is she headed to East Anglia. She was very popular there. She had a lot of supporters. She went to, from, to Kenning Hall first in Norfolk, one of her big holdings, and she invited supporters to come to her. And she invited them to get their friends to come to her. And she reached out to the nobles with whom she had relationship and asked them to support her. And she started building a stronghold of support. So she went where she knew she could count on the people. And then she began to invite others to support her, to join her team, to come with her as well and to recognize her as queen. She positioned herself in her strongest way, which was as the daughter of Henry VIII, who had been acknowledged by his parliament as the successor to the throne. And so she relied on that and she invited people to join her. And before long, there were so many supporters that Kenning Hall couldn't accommodate them all. So she moved to Framlingham Castle, one of her other holdings, and was able to assemble a larger and larger and growing military force. And she gained the support of nobles. And she gained the support of other villagers who would bring their family and friends with them. And it just kept growing and growing. And within just a few days, it had to happen right now. The longer that Jane Grey stayed on the throne, the more secure she became. It couldn't be, well, within six months, I'm going to do this. Oh, no, no. It had to happen right now. And within just a few days, Mary was really able to change the story completely. So in less than a week, in less than a week from her brother's death, she had assembled a large force that was willing to march to London and fight for her right to take the throne. And the size of that force, the size, the widespread nature of Mary's support, that news spread quickly. And Jane's support throughout the country and even in London began to crumble as Mary's continued to grow. And on the 19th of July, which was just 13 days after Edward's death and just a few, just a little shorter than that after Jane was proclaimed queen, on the 19th of July, Mary was proclaimed queen. And in less than two weeks, she had changed everything. How did she do that? She did it with a right now plan. First, her first step was believing in herself, being completely clear about what she wanted and committed to her ability to get what she wanted. She might not have known exactly how she was going to do it, but she knew, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just gonna grab a cup of water here. She knew she could do it, and she believed that was her destiny. And so she went in big. Her big goal was clear. She was committed. She acted decisively and immediately. She started right now. She took the steps. She did what she could immediately do. 
Second, she was realistic when things changed. She had expected to be announced as Edward's heir, recognized as queen the minute he died. That's the way it had been planned. But Mary was realistic when things changed. She knew if she went to court, that was not what was going to happen. She was not going to be proclaimed queen. So she was realistic and she went somewhere else. She went where she had supporters. She was working within the reality that was facing her. She wasn't wishing, oh, I wish things could be different. Well, of course, she probably did wish things could be different, but she acted in the reality that she was facing. Not what she had been expecting, but what she was really facing. And she went to her stronghold to gather support, which brings us to the third thing she did. She asked for the help she needed. She couldn't do it in, alone. She couldn't do it without the support of the English people, without the nobility, without the armed forces, without people who were willing to literally fight for her. She couldn't do it alone. So she invited people to be on her team. She let them know she needed them and she asked for what she needed. That was all part of a right now plan. She had to come up with that. She had to appeal to them. She had to let them know her vision for herself and her vision for the country. And it couldn't take weeks or even days to come up with a glossy, perfectly phrased appeal. No, she invited support right now. She reached out to people immediately. She shared her vision with others and they all worked together. And then when she was successful in that 13 day period, that was a right now plan that achieved success in less than two weeks time. I mean, it's really extraordinary. She did share her success. She was generous with her supporters. She recognized the people who had gotten her there. And she was merciful for absolutely as long as she could be until the next big rebellion. She was merciful to Jane Grey. She recognized the need to try and bring people together. She was not divisive. She was inclusive for as long as she could be. Now, my guess is that in today's world, most of us, the vast majority of us, I would even say everyone listening right now, is not going to be faced with, oh, I expected to be the queen or the king and then something changed. But we will all be faced with something unexpected. Whether it's like 2020 and a worldwide pandemic, whether it's losing a deal you were counting on, whether it's an illness, whether it's something personal or in your family or in your corporate or work world, we will all face unexpected things that shift the reality we're working with. And so while it is absolutely important and so helpful and necessary to have a long-term plan, history shows us the value of a right now plan. It's not even a short-term plan. It's a right now plan. What do you need to do right now? And I think Mary is such a great example of that because her decisiveness, her strategic thinking, her level of commitment and clarity to what she was doing enabled her to completely change the narrative, to turn that reality she was faced with upside down and to ride into London celebrated as the Queen of England to succeed because of her right now plan. And even if our success is on a different scale, which it probably will be, we too can use a right now plan when things shift or things change or something doesn't go the way we thought we needed to take the new reality and do what Mary did, come up with a right now plan. 
be clear with ourselves and committed to what we want. Be realistic about the new reality. Ask for the help we need and share our success as well as our vision with others. Work together, help others with their plans as well. And I think we can all agree that as we help each other, we can make those right now moments and the right now plan work to our benefit and to the benefit of others. So thank you for joining me for this episode of Life Lessons from the Tutors. I am Carol Ann Lloyd, and I would love to hear from you about your right now plan and about how history shows you what's possible. Thank you so much. <music>